Welcome to the Traveling Professors. I'm Professor Bob. And I'm Professor Sherry. And together we are the, the Traveling, Traveling Professors. Professors. Hi, Professor Sherry on this end. Well, you know, most of my friends think I'm crazy. I get so excited when my husband says, hey, we get to go to a Bronze Age village, you know, or city and see everything that was there, the religious center, the political center, where the Minoans were, and I get really excited. This map illustrates where we are going today. We're going down to the capital city, if you wish to call it that, one of the main palaces of the Minoan civilization, which is Knossos on the island of Crete. And you can see there, there are several other major palatial cities. You can see Mycenae in Greece and Mycenae, where we've taken tours before. And there's Troy up in the upper right-hand corner. And we've taken tours of that as well. So our tour of Knossos should complete the major cities and palaces of this Bronze Age period. Knossos was excavated by Sir Arthur Evans, as you see here, who lived from 1851 to 1941, and one of the founders of modern archaeology. He was a contemporary with Heinrich Schliemann, and together they did as best they could, and they're still very controversial. Evans is very controversial in Greece because of the reconstructions that he did. Sometimes it's his best guess, sometimes he's right, sometimes he isn't. One of the issues that they have is that the reconstructions need to be reconstructed. And with Greece needing every dime that they can for everything, there's not enough money to go around. So you have a choice. Do you fix the reconstructions or do you continue with regular archaeological work? But I think viewing the site with us, taking this tour with us, you'll see how it really helps a novice, a tourist, if you will, to get a real idea of the grandeur of the site. While it's it's not necessarily 100%, 75% of what it should be. Evans did his best, although he really came to the conclusion that one of the reasons he did it was that he thought people would pay money to come and visit the site if they could see a little better view of it. It is pretty controversial. So you can make up your own mind viewing the archaeological site with Sherry and I as we walk through. As you look at these pictures, you're going to see red pillars everywhere. And I find the pillars to be particularly interesting. They were made from cypress trees. Okay, They're not marble or granite like you would expect. They made them out of cypress trees and when you really look at them, the ones they have now represent the ones they had then. They're narrow at the bottom and bigger at the top. And there's a reason for this. They did it this way so that the trees didn't sprout. You've seen a couple of the artistic renderings of what the capital of Knossos looked like. Here we have a couple of pictures. One of them is an aerial photograph of the site that you would visit. And you can't really tell how extensive it is nor how much climbing up and down you're going to have to do. And next to it is, of course, the, the drawing of the site, that a kind of a map that you would find in any kind of a guidebook. And if you find a guidebook that has this in it, you'll notice that there's probably over 80 different spots that there's something to see. So it is a very extensive site. It goes up multiple levels. Uh, and you can actually, this is just the palace. There are other other grounds, a couple of burial sites and some other features that you can see out and away from this. So it is quite extensive. And you can see why, if you're just looking at, at this, how you could end up saying, well, it's a labyrinth. You could get lost here. Yes, you can get lost here pretty easily. If the building were completely restored, as you see in the artist's renditions, it's very easy that you could end up getting lost in some sort of a labyrinth. And of course, that only plays into the legend of the Minotaur. When Sherry and I were in Herculon on Crete, uh, we wanted to figure out how to get to, to visit Knossos. Well, we found out that the double-decker bus that you see here ends up going there as well. And we like riding the double-decker bus. As a matter of fact, usually what Sherry and I do is when we come into a town, and usually mid-afternoon to late afternoon, we pick up our tickets for one of these and then do a co complete circuit of the city. By getting it late in the afternoon, it's usually good for 24 hours. So then in the morning, you get up and go where you really wanted to go. And that's exactly what we did here. We got up in the morning, got the very first ride, dropped us off at Knossos. We were there for approximately four hours. And then when we were finished, we got on the next one and took us back to where we started. So it's it was one way of doing it. You could go to the museum, the archaeological museum in Knossos, and they had buses that also ran from there. You can obviously take a taxi. I did not have an idea of how much that cost. 
lost, but it was fun using the double-decker bus, so you got a nice view of, of the city at the same time. Just as you come into the archaeological site and you're coming towards the palace, you see three large pits known as the Cooleries. And they have stone line walls. They were built in the West Court during the old palatial period, which would have been 1900 to 1700 BC. Uh, the excavation workmen gave them their name. And Arthur Evans, the archaeologist in charge of the dig, decided to keep the name. The function of the circular pits still isn't clear. They have been interpreted as rubbish dumps, either for all the refuse of the palace or just the leftovers from sacred offerings. Support has also been given to the idea that they were for storing grain. In two of them it is possible to see the remains of the houses of the pre-palatial period, which those are really old, 3200 to 1900 BC. In the new palace period, 1700 to 1450 BC, the cooleries were actually covered over and went completely out of use. On our chart, here is where the Cooleries were located. Now we're heading to the south. We're walking by what is known as the West Porch, or the Corridor of the Procession. We are heading to the South House. To Sherry and I, the South House was one of the most beautiful places uh, at Knossos. And it's in the southern part of the palace area, and the area was much destroyed, and its reconstruction is to some extent uncertain. Evans thought that here, at its far southwest, there was an entrance that approached a splendid stepped ascent with colonnades. Uh, down to the left is the restored sa uh, south house. It has been reconstructed with its three stories. Many architectural and decorative features of the palace are reproduced in the house. Lustral basin, washing area, pillar room, and they f the frequent use of gypsum. It is therefore considered to have been a rather special house in the new palace period, 1700 to 1450 BC, and it may have been a guest house for visiting dignitaries. Here's where we are after we finish looking at the South House. Now we are going to head up and visit the South Propylium, which is where you find the cupbearer fresco, and then we will move up into the reconstruction, walking through the uh, Plano Nebile and the Tricolumnar Shrine, and then we will reach the building, which is the Hall of the Fresco Copies. This building is probably one of the most controversial on the site because they're not really sure it was built as it is set up but it's a nice place to show the different types of frescoes. Then I'll also show you a, a shot of the backside of the, of the palace as well as the front side so you get an idea of the terrain that we are in. This is the view that you see from the south house looking up towards the palace, and you can see the, the bull horns here. There's a significant amount of palace to weave and bob your way around before you reach that column area, which is part of what is known as the south propylae. Here's a little better view as we're getting up from one side to get a nice shot to get up on that level and then heading on in. Now, one of the problems you have when you're on sites like this is if a very large tour group gets in front of you. And they had individual groups that you could get your own individual guide. This was a particularly large group and a particularly long-winded guide. So we actually waited about 10, or 10 minutes and then went around them and then came back after viewing everything Thing to get some close, this closer picture. Now, the South Propylium, as it is called, is a result of the restoration of Evans, who put up a copy of the cupbearer fresco. The wall painting depicted a man holding a libation vase, a right on. The theme is connected with the procession fresco, which is on the other side of the wall that we walk down to see the South, the South House. So it, it's very beautiful. Again, the originals are not here. The originals are all in the museum in Herculon, which you have to see, and then you can look at those really nice. But it's just nice to see them in position. The Greeks are not happy about this. A lot of archaeological people are not happy about this because it, to some extent, messes up the study of the of the actual site. But from the standpoint of letting you feel as to what it was like to be there, it's great. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's, very, it's positive on the one hand, it's negative on the other. I think the art is particularly fantastic. Fantastic. Whether you see it in a museum or you see the copies are at the site, uh, you get mythological creatures, you get animals, you get people, you get the famous bull jumping going on, you get marine life. In fact, here we have a, a picture of an octopus. How could that just be any more charming? I would take a copy of that and put it on my walls today to 
Here we are in the room of the Hall of Fresco Copies. Again, originals are in the museum in Herculon. And you see these beautiful reconstructions, the three, the three ladies, the octopus. Uh, the area there in front of the octopus is actually the staircase leading down to the throne room. But you have a porch on this area. You can look out on different uh, venues and, and see the sights from here. And then once we left the, the Hall of the Fresco copies. We took a look down below and that's the line waiting to get in for your 20 seconds or so view of the throne room. We're hoping that that will get shorter by the time we get down there. As we continue through the labyrinth that is the Knossos Palace, our next stop is going to be the main courtyard. And from the main courtyard, we'll then move to the throne room, get a chance to see the throne where the king operated. And then we'll come back down the courtyard area to the site of the south entrance, which is the corridor of the Prince of Lilies, which is another wonderful fresco. After that, we will then head down into the other area of Knossos to see the Queens, Megaron. Here we are in the central courtyard. Now this measures 50 meters by 25 meters and is actually an architectural element common to all Minoan palaces. It connects all the different courts. It has what you see up ahead is the line for the throne room. But you would have had meetings. You would have had rituals that were performed here uh, in the high point of Knossos under the Minoans. This was actually the religious center of the people. So all sorts of events would have taken place here. So now we'll go and, and get in Line. And as you can see, the line to the throne room is a lot shorter than it was when we were up above in the room with all the uh, fresco copies. The throne room, as you can see here, its name derives from the small gypsum throne that was preserved intact in the position it still occupies today, as were the stone benches. The room was probably a religious function. The priest king sitting on the throne with the priests on either side of the benches. The sacred nature of this area is also in indicated by the lustral bath, which is opposite. It's actually not a bath because it doesn't have a drain. So it's believed to be part of a purification ritual that was most likely symbolic. The throne room has interesting artwork in it as well. The griffins, so colorful, so beautiful. When you look at the throne room, though, it's, you know, you're used to English throne rooms and French throne rooms, you know, huge and big and painted ceilings and everything. This is a very small room. Um, besides the griffins, if you look on the throne, you will also see a crescent moon. And the crescent moon is a symbol that was frequently used for a fertility symbol. As we leave the throne room, we come to the grand staircase. Now, a large part of the east wing of the palace actually can't be seen from the central court as it's built into the side of the hill on top of which lies the rest of the palace. It is one of the most interesting parts of the palace because two stories are preserved below the level of the central court. Today, a large part of it has been reconstructed in concrete. The stories are connected with one another by means of a system of stairs known as the grand staircase. The staircase was found during the excavation in its original position. There is a total of four flights of stairs, two for each story. The two lower flights are preserved as they were found. The steps are broad and deep with a gentle incline that makes for easy ascent. The staircase is lit by large light wells and are surrounded by a colonnade of wooden columns. At the base of this, you then run into the Queen's Megaron and the Queen's Chambers. As we prepare to leave the central courtyard, we come to the south end entrance, known as the Corridor with the Princes of the Lilies. Press court is reconstructed. Evans put up a copy of a relief wall painting here, of which only a few fragments were found. These are in the museum, and actually it's the uh, the artwork that Sherry's going to talk about is actually the museum, what survives of it. Evans believed it was his opinion that it represented a priest king. Other scholars think it is a prince, while others believe it depicts a female figure. So there's still a lot of guesses work to go. See the, the the priest or the king here with the peacock feathers in his hair? Another little piece of art and his necklace of lilies? Isn't that just stunning? I love it. 
Leaving the Prince of the Lilies, we now go out off of the courtyard and head down two stories to the lower level, where we'll then be going to see the Queen's Megaron, the Hall of the Double Axes, the Magazines of the Pithoi, and the Corridor of the Draft Board. The palace area here becomes a little bit more confused, so here's the route that we're going to take on this map. First thing we're going to go to and see is the Queen's Megaron and the Hall of Double Axes, which are actually in the same area. And once we finish there, we'll go down to the area where you have what is known as the magazine of the Pithoi, which is where you have these very large containers. Then we end up going up a little bit and into this corridor known as the corridor of the draft board. And this is where they found this game, a nice picture of it uh, from the museum. So that's where we're heading at this particular point. The Hall of the Double Axes was named by Evans due to the double axe signs engraved on the walls of the light well that's in the rear. He thought that it was also a place of residence for the king. The central area has openings on three sides and therefore called a polythyron. It has a slab floor and is embellished with gypsum slabs and frescoes. The area between the polythyron and the light well were used as a reception hall and Evans reconstructed a wooden throne at this particular spot. The Queen's Megaron is near or next to the Hall of the Double Axes. It's a smaller hall, comparably arranged and richly decorated. Evans thought that it must belong to the queen because he found fragments of frescoes with dolphins and dancing ladies. The room is largely restored and copies of the wall paintings have been put up on the walls. Now the unfortunate thing here, it was almost impossible to take pictures because of the, the room being partitioned off with plexiglass and the light that was available at that particular time reflected badly and so we didn't get any pictures trying to shoot into that region. But there's also a section with a low wall that was thought by Evans to be the Queen's bathroom, since pieces of a clay bath were found in there. Uh, a corridor joins the Queen Megaron with rooms that have been interpreted as places of preparation and washing. On our way to the magazine of the Pithoi, we stop by the Lapidary's workshop. It's behind what is known as the schoolroom. The schoolroom is an area that Evans thought people were working and writing on clay tablets. It's more likely that it was a workshop for ceramics or wall paint. But the lapidary workshop, you see there's blocks laying there on, on the ground. Those are unworked and semi-worked lapis lacedomani, which is Spartan basalt. And there were stone tools that were also found here that were brought to light. According to Evans, the main workshop was actually on the upper floor from which vases and large stone amphora had simply fallen to the ground. But anyway, that's what they refer to it. There, there's all of these little chambers that some have names and some don't. This, this one, you can see those blocks of Spartan basalt, which is quite nice. The magazines of the giant pithoi that is in the East Bastion. The great pithoi, which are storage jars that you see before you, were found in a place named by Evans the magazines of the giant pithoi. These magazines are one of the older parts of the palace. The pithoi are set apart by their size, the number of handles, and the richness of their relief decorations. These are originally storage jars. Uh, they're all over the palace. They would store food and all sorts of other items. Some of them actually in the lower areas are filled with natron, which is the drying agents the Egyptians used for mummification because it draws moisture out. They would use them to keep the basements dry. And these pithoi are, are huge. Some of them are big enough to put me in them and I'm 6'2". The painted ones are more or less in the main museum but they have a nice selection of them scattered around. Uh, and you can see this, this one picture this whole length of them there's one section where it shows them underneath cover. And there's one where the floors have collapsed. And that would have been just filled with, with grain storage and all sorts of other storage. So that's what the pithoi are. This area of the palace is near what is known the Corridor of the Draft. The Royal Gaming Board was found here. It's a kind of board game made of ivory, rock crystal, Egyptian blue, silver, and gold. And it's now in the Herculon Museum. Now, if you see, this this is the actual surviving draft board. And they have pieces that went with it as well. It looks very much like the, uh, the Royal Game of Ur in some fashion. But uh, you have all of this inlay on it 
and it's very nicely laid out in the museum. Well, it's back to the map time again. The final locations on our trip through the Knossos Palace. Our next stop is going to be what is known as the Customs House, which is where the bull fresco is located. Then we have the northern entrance corridor, which is actually directly in front of that at its base. Then we go to the north lustral basin, bathing area, water area, then the, to the Knossos Theater, and then the Royal Road. And then we will have taken the tour of Knossos. We're now in the north sector of the palace. The first room of the sector is a rectangular and large oriented north-south building that's traversed by a row of eight half-restored columns and on the north two round columns. The room was thought by Evans to have been a customs house to check the merchandise arriving at the harbor. The north part still preserves the entrance opening, which formed the north gate of the palace. The bastions projected from both sides of the corridor, which supported colonnades and created covered rooms rooms decorated with frescoes. Evans largely restored the West Bastion and also adorned it with a copy of the famous bull fresco that was found fallen in the corridor. Here is what survives of the original fresco of the bull. It's in the Herculon Museum. Once we leave the Customs House, going westward, we will turn south to see the lustral basin of the palace. The Northern Lustral Basin. The building you see resembles a cistern. Its floor is lower than the surrounding area and is reached by steps. The Lustral Basin was surrounded by columns and was lined with slabs of gypsum, giving it a luxurious appearance. In its present form, the area has been completely reconstructed by Evans. Areas with a similar arrangement have been found in other parts of the Palace of Knossos, as well as at other palaces and in important Minoan buildings in the period 1700 to 1450 BC. It is not known how these places were used. However, their construction gives the, the belief that they would not have been filled with water because there wasn't any drainage. Evans thought they were used in purification ceremonies and therefore called these places lustral basins. Evans also believed the palace was a sacred place. That is why, in his opinion, the lustral basin in question was used to purify visitors going into the palace via the neighboring north entrance because the roads come into this particular area and you can see the steps going down and then as you walk away from the palace heading towards the main road this is the back side of it we're now behind the palace and we're actually standing on what is known as the theater it's a relatively shallow seating area but we'll see it better from a longer distance out in front of us with the two people there they're walking on part of what is the Royal Road. As you go further down, it's blocked. You should be able to walk from here into Herculon, actually, and to the harbor. But they really don't want you doing that. So here's Sherry standing as far as we can go. And then here's a shot looking over the, shall we say, chain area to see the road continuing on up ahead. It's wide enough for about two two carts, two small carts, or two donkeys. Uh, you then also, if you turn, when we turned around, you can see how the road splits. One of them on the right side will go up to the back side of the palace through the north entrance and the other one goes to that raised area of steps which is known as the theater so anyway after we finished at this particular point it's time to leave we've been here almost four hours it's time to have a little lunch. So we walked back through the pathway that's arranged to get us back to the beginning and went to the cafe that they had there and sat up and had a nice relaxing lunch and, and, uh, and then listened to all the noise. There was all hell breaking loose because this place is full of peacocks and peahens. And so we heard all this noise. And so I stood up on one of the benches and looked over to see what was going on. And there is Mr. Peacock. And he's been performing his fancy dance and ultimately as you can see here he is successful in mating with one of the local peahens so we had lunch while the peacocks were having a little action and so that ends our our wonderful trip to Canossus and we hope you enjoyed it Sherry and I hope you enjoyed the tour please come by our YouTube channel at Bob Packett on YouTube it should be History According to Bob, but it comes up as Bob Packett. That's the easiest way to get to it. And please subscribe and leave some comments. Thank you very much. 
I hope you enjoyed the show. Please uh, subscribe, give a comment, and if you like history, please come by historyaccordingtobob.com website where I do six podcasts a week on different topics in history, and there's all sorts of CDs and other things that you can see. So thank you very much.